Charles is 17 years of age. He's facing the rest of his life in prison. Antonio Bernard, known as TJ, is 21. He's facing the rest of his life in prison, as they should be because they took a young person's life. Let me take you back and give you some of the details. It's Saturday evening, about 9.30, at the Bowling Alley on 542 east of Winter Haven. Our three suspects show up in a stolen blue Lexus out of Hillsborough County. Why did they show up? Because they're waiting for the opposing gang. Now, we're not telling the gang names because we don't want to market for them, but they got there about 9.30. So about 10.30, 11 o'clock, the opposing gang members showed up. That's right. There were four of them. Because they're victims, we can't give you their names, so we'll tell you that one was a Hispanic male, 17, one was a black male, 20, one was a black male, 17, and one was a black male, 26. He was ultimately the driver. So understand that our suspects show up about 9.30. Our victims show up about 10.30 or 11. They wait in the parking lot in the stolen vehicle for the victims who are in the bowling alley. They actually make a run at the victims at one point in time in the parking lot and it appears as if they were going to attack them there in the parking lot. However, another vehicle got in their way, so they patiently waited. Now it's about 1 o'clock in the morning. Our four victims leave in the Toyota Camry, a silver Toyota Camry, and they go onto the Buckeye Loop Road, which travels kind of north direction. And as it makes a curve back in toward the city of Winter Haven, it turns into MLK. As soon as our victim vehicle pulls out, our suspect vehicle follows them. Follows them up Buckeye Loop Road as they make the curve back to the west, going into Florence Villa, which is a community in Winter Haven. The suspects pass the silver vehicle. At that moment in time, Michael Jean Charles is the driver. Jermaine Hawthorne has a 9mm handgun. He's only 16 years old. He's got a 9mm handgun. TJ, who's 21, has an AK-type assault rifle. They open fire on the silver Camry. All four victims in the silver Camry are struck by many, many, many rounds of ammunition as they're shot. They're shot. One of our victims, who's only 17 years of age, loses a leg. They had to amputate it. They were shot several times. Another one of our victims, who's a black male 20, lost his life. He was murdered. He was shot multiple times. The driver was shot. The fourth victim was shot. One victim returned fire and ultimately struck Antonio. They continued on as they pass, and they drop Antonio, known as TJ, at the hospital, and the investigation begins. We arrive, we've got four victims shot and one dead at the scene. Kids, 
They're all kids, and they're all gang members. We've got the others that are shot up significantly. The investigation goes on. Once again, we, uh, once again, we actually investigated this for a period of time to try to sort out the details. We had arrested some of these folks early on for tampering with evidence, those kinds of charges, but now they're charged with what they should be charged with and that's first degree murder. The investigation's still underway. They dumped the guns. We don't know where they are. We certainly would like to have them. If you know where they are and you call Crime Stoppers, 1-800-226-TIPS. When you call Crime Stoppers and tell us where those guns are, when they match up to the crime scene, we will make sure that you get a reward that is far exceeds the value of those firearms. Are there any questions about this case? Did, uh, <clears throat> I recall when this case happened, there was a car that was found that was burned up about 45 minutes later that you were looking into whether that was connected or not? Yes, absolutely unrelated at this time. We find that suspicious because it was in the area, but it was, it was not uh, related to this at all. How, how frustrating is it, and it probably goes without saying, that you, you, know, you have to continue to have these types of press conferences and situations like this continue to happen? Well, you know, what's remarkable, our crime rate is re remarkably low in this county, at a 50-year low. But these kids are shooting up each other. They're having drive-by shootings at their houses. They're having running gun battles in the street, and we're not accepting it. In fact, I haven't formally announced, but we've started a gang task force. We're also joined by the Auburndale Police Department, the Haines City Police Department, the Lake Wells Police Department. They've donated officers to us. I have sworn them in as special deputies. And we are focused on educating the parents of these gang bangers so there's no mistake we're sitting on the couch and in the living room with the parents of these gang bangers saying they're in a gang, they're associated with a gang, we would rather see them arrested as opposed to dead or locked up for first degree murder and we are going to make them a project as long as they violate the law and are actively part of the gang and actively drive, doing drive-by shootings. That team just came together and we'll be talking more about them later on okay they've been working just a little while any more questions on this one if i remember correctly one of those three men were dropped off at the hospital is that right tj, TJ. he was shot by the by w the one victim <clears throat> through the chest the victim that shot him was actually struck like four times with gunfire. There was a hell of gunfire down on this victim's vehicle. They waited hours for them in the parking lot in order to kill all of them. Fortunately, three of the victims survived, one didn't. They're all kids, 16, 17, 20. The one driver was 26. And, and by the way, in the suspect vehicle, there's one person we've still not identified once we identify him, he too can very likely pick up a first degree murder charge. So far, he's been totally under the radar screen. A call to Crime Stoppers will get you a whole lot of money to identify who the fourth suspect is. Think about it, family and friends. If Jermaine, Michael, or TJ is your family member, and they're going to prison for the rest of their life for first degree murder, shouldn't the fourth guy in the car get to go with them? Why is he getting off scot-free? Are y'all really gonna hide him? Are you really gonna hide him when all your buds, your family members, your friends are going to prison? Think about it. 
we're not going to let kids shoot kids in this county. You do it, you're going to prison for a very long time or life. We don't care that you're 16 or 17 or 19 or 18. You're not even supposed to have a gun, much less shooting other kids with it. It's not happening. You're going to find out this is not fun and games, and the prison system's real, and we're coming after you. Any questions on that one? Well, if that's not enough of a shocker, our team's been really busy. Let me introduce you to Richard Battle. He's 24 years of age. He's a Polk County firefighter. We arrested him. That's right. In 2019, he saw a 14-year-old child on Instagram. And so he added her to his Snapchat account and started communicating with her. She told him she was 14. Didn't make any difference. He started asking her, the victim, for nude pictures. This little girl's 14. She said no. He said, well, you know, I've got you on Snapchat and it gives your address I know where you live. I'm going to come tell your mama what you've been doing if you don't send me some nude videos. That's right. He extorted her. She was 14. She was a child. She was afraid. So she sent nude videos. She didn't say anything about it at the time. She was young. She was timid. She was scared. So over the next almost two years, two and a half years, he still asked her periodically, hey, how about some more nude videos? How, how, how about some more nude videos? Well, finally, she got enough of it. He made some statement to her just recently. So she started searching him up. He used his real name, made it easy. She found out that he was a firefighter. She saw him in his firefighter's uniform, pictures with a fire truck. She had a friend that she told about this. This guy who's been doing this to me for two years is a firefighter. Well, folks, we're all held to a higher standard in public safety. That enraged our victim who was 14 at the time and now is almost 17. So there was a report to the fire department. The fire department, as you know they would, did the right thing and called us. We began an investigation and he admitted. He gave us admissions. Well, I thought she was 18. Well, newsflash, she's not. Instead of fighting a hot fire, you got a hot mess on your hands because you are in the county jail now. And your next stop, we hope, is the state prison. We're not accepting this. It's zero tolerance. You're not going to attack these children online. You're just not going to do that without there being retribution from the criminal justice system. Now. This is also a warning to parents. Parents, this guy was doing this while she was 14. Where was the child app protection setting on her cell phone when she's a little 14-year-old girl? Parents, why aren't you talking to your children? This child was extorted by this guy. Extorted. And now he's locked up. He won't be fighting any fires. Um, any questions? Yeah, I was going to ask. So he said he claims that he thought she was 18, but it sounds like you have proof that she told him she was 14 and he said okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Welcome to the county jail. 
the closest thing he's going to get to a fire, maybe he'll get him a hot chili dog at the jail or something. I don't know. How much courage did this teenager finally have to, to, to come forward? It was remarkable. We are looking at additional charges. I think he was stalking her because he just wouldn't leave her alone. So we're investigating that with the state attorney's office now. He wouldn't leave her alone. And finally she said, enough. She grew up. She grew up a little bit. And she said, he doesn't have a right to do that to me. He already intimidated me into sending him pictures that I never should have sent. Well, if you think that's bad, we got another one. Let me introduce you to Derek Stribling. He's 39. Derek lives in Lakeland. You know, he was also a basketball player for UT and Tennessee Tech and was a free agent or in the draft for the NBA back in the day. What does he do now? Well, he's a teacher and a dean. That's right. He was at Crossroads Christian School where he was a dean of students, a history teacher, a basketball coach, and a life management coach. Now, the life management that he was teaching these children is frightening. Is absolutely frightening. And here's how it all started. Victim number one, who was 18 and a student at the school, was having trouble with her father. Her, and she said, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to come to school anymore. So she's confiding in Derek Stribling, her dean, her life management teacher. And, and she, during the conversations, it brought up that, by the way, the teacher told her, you've got a D in class right now. And she asked, was there any extra work I can do to bring my D grade up? And he went, hmm, as a matter of fact. And they started talking about sex. And it was filthy talk, nasty talk. And as a result, he began to do all kinds of nasty things and send it to her through social media. He asked to meet her to have sex and she refused because he was married. Did you hear what I said? He's married. He's a dean of students. He's her bas he is a basketball coach. He's a life management coach. But this went on and we were notified. We were notified the principal learned of it, notified us, and we began an investigation. During the investigation, by the way, we learned that her D ended up an A. Isn't that amazing? So he used his position as her teacher and her low grade as the nexus, and they taught the nasty. So as this investigation's gone on, victim one has backed out of having sex. She actually, he had arranged a date and time and location. But let me take you back to victim two. Victim two and victim one were talking. Victim two said when she was 14, she's now 16, two years ago, he did the same stuff with her. The nasty video clips, the inappropriate behavior, the sexual content. And on one occasion, now I'm not gonna stutter here, the suspect kissed and fondled the 14-year-old at the school in the equipment closet. 
about two years ago. So victim two and victim one are talking, and it's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, by the way, victim two was on the basketball team at the time that he was coaching. We really, really, really fear there are other victims out there that were like this 16-year-old that were afraid, that didn't report it, that think, well, maybe I did some ha-ha, fun, fun talk. No, that's not all right. He's in a position of authority over her and them. We truly believe, based on his pattern and conduct, there very well may be other victims, and we want to know about that. He is locked up right now in the county jail, and our goal is to send him to prison for a very long time for taking advantage of children of students of the Crossroad Christian School who were entrusted to his care. This is horribly offensive at every level and wrong at every level. He's supposed to be the adult. He also was grooming the, the parents. We talked to parents who thought he was a great guy, was glad that he was in a position of being their teacher because he was so nice. You know what we learn about deviants, pedophiles, predators? They have charisma, they have personality, they attach themselves to not only the victims but to the parents. So that's right, parents. He very well likely has befriended you the whole time he can be sexually battering your child. We need to know. The parents need to have a conversation with their children to see if there are more victims. Please help us. This is a major ongoing investigation by our special victims unit at this time. Are there any questions? Was he still working at the school up until his arrest? Yes, he was. He was suspended by the principal then the principal came to us the next morning after the suspension and notified the sheriff's office. Um, you know, we've seen in these two cases that this had gone on or began two, three years ago. Um, what does it say about how, how women who are being victimized like this can be intimidated to the point where it can take that amount of time? Well, they become embarrassed. They somehow blame themselves. Well, maybe my conversation or my lack of conversation or, or my lack of saying no makes me a participant. That's not true. So that's why we feel there's other young ladies who were groomed into doing things that's horribly embarrassing. So they're just going to absorb it and keep quiet. It'll come out years later if they don't deal with it now. So parents, if there are other victims, help your children deal with it now so we can deal with him now. We know there's at least two. And if there's two, why aren't there three or four or five? He's worked there for a long time. He's had a lot of access to a lot of children. We've got to know. We want to help the children. We want to make sure they have the appropriate services because they're victims. Victims. They're child victims. And he is a bad man. He is a deviant. He is a pedophile and a deviant. How long had he worked at the school, do you know? I'm not sure right now. We can get that for you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, folks. Thanks, this is uh, some heavy-hitting cases today that are all still under investigation. See you all.